I'd like to turn on the next uh, topic, and uh, this is another topic that was requested by last year's attendees. And so I'd like to um, introduce Dr. James, Jim Kovat, uh, who is a professor of biochemistry from University of Kansas Medical Center. And his topic is uh, going to be on emergent therapeutic, uh, experimental therapeutics for ADPKD. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, York. Um, thank you for putting together such a wonderful conference. Uh, as a non-clinician, I've I've actually learned quite a bit, and and there's more to come. I should also add to this introduction that I'm in the newly renamed Jared Grantham Kidney Institute at Kansas. These are my disclosures. <clears throat> um, this is my outline uh, for today. Um, I thought I'd start with first a, a look at uh, we're really revisiting cyclic AMP uh, and why we think about it in, in therapy development. Uh, and then I will uh, talk about um, trials in progress and then uh, those in preclinical development. And I want to say a few words about HSP90 inhibitors as, as potential uh, therapies. And then I want to finish with uh, some comments about therapies over the horizon. So first, let's look at, at potential targets of therapy. Now, this is a PKD cell. Um, showing a lot of abnormally regulated signaling pathways uh, in PKD, and in green, some potential therapies and therapies that are in trials right now. Um, this was published uh, 10 years ago um, in 2009 um, by uh, doctors Vicente Torres and Peter Harris. And I'm showing you this. I don't want to go into this in, in detail, but I'm showing you this um, because I think the, the whole process starts with a dysregulation of intracellular calcium, which then leads to an abnormal cellular response to cyclic AMP and then an increase in cyclic AMP and then an activation of protein kinase A or PKA. Now, this, this theme has been published by the uh, Taurus-Harris team uh, again and again. This uh, shows, again, the central role of calcium and cyclic AMP and, and PKA. And in this JCI review published uh, in 2014, you see the same. And uh, here, uh, this was published in 2015 in a Nature Reviews Nephrology um, in a different context. And again, uh, just last year, uh, this was published. And again, you can see the central roles of calcium, cyclic AMP, and PKA. And here you can see, uh, when looking at uh, dysregulation of metabolic uh, pathways, um, cyclic AMP and PKA uh, have a very prominent role. I'd like to look at, at this in, in a slightly different way. So keep in mind a pyramid. Uh, and uh, so here you can see these pathways uh, really starting at the, at the very top with the PKD mutation uh, leading to, in, in my view, really the central defect, which is a, a dysregulation of intracellular calcium. And then this leads to um, additional abnormalities, additional signaling pathways that, that kind of widen and deepen into cellular processes. Um, and, and, and ultimately, they lead to phenotypic transformation, giving you uh, the PKD phenotype, which is characterized by increased cell proliferation, increased uh, fluid secretion and the other hallmarks of uh, PKD cells. 
but it all, it all starts up here. And so in terms of therapy development, um, I think it's important to think about going up to the top where you might have the largest impact on, on the whole process, the whole downstream uh, process. And I'd like to mention, you know, in particular, I, I think cyclic AMP dysregulation um, along with a decrease in the activity of a calcium regulated transcription factor, nuclear factor of activated T cells or NFAT, I think these are, are really the two probably most important uh, dysregulated functions in PKD and so I call them co-conspirators in this process. And I want to point out that this dysregulation of, of uh, cyclic AMP is primarily an abnormality in the cellular response to cyclic AMP, and then that's exacerbated by an increase in that. So the first thing to think about is, is um, what, what this dysregulation means. And, and I want to clarify that because sometimes this is a sort of misunderstood in the, in the PKD field. And so, in, so I want to explain what I mean uh, by showing you some signaling pathways. <clears throat> so over here, this would be what's happening in normal cells. These, this is the RASMAP kinase pathway in normal renal epithelial cells with normal polycystins, normal levels of calcium. And this normal calcium keeps BRAF repressed uh, so that uh, actually in the presence of cyclic AMP, there's actually an inhibitory phosphorylation of RAF1, and that really blocks activation of this pathway. So growth factors can't really activate this pathway and stimulate um, <clears throat> cell proliferation. So you could say that in normal renal epithelial cells, cyclic AMP is anti-mitogenic. And then in PKD cells, with loss of the polycystins and, and lower intracellular calcium, uh, you can see that BRAF becomes derepressed so that the same cyclic AMP can now bypass this inhibitory phosphorylation and activate BRAF, MEK, and ERK, and stimulate um, cell proliferation. So this is what I call the PKD phenotype. Uh, we, can, we can see this in isolated primary cells from, from PKD kidneys, cystic cells, or we can take normal cells uh, and just lower intracellular calcium using calcium channel blockers, and we can create this PKD phenotype. And then we can take PKD cells and actually normalize them by increasing calcium. So they become normal now to the, to the response of, of cyclic AMP. <clears throat> now, it's not as simple as that, though, because we've also found, <clears throat> and this is largely in, in unpublished work so far, <clears throat> that this phenotypic switch doesn't simply inhibit this pathway, but it also causes a decrease in the activation of, of NFAT. And you really need both happening in order to carry out this phenotypic switch. So I, that's why I call I, I call these the co-conspirators, is that a decrease in calcium and fat is required to show you that or give you that abnormal cyclic AMP uh, effect. So given that, then the rationale for PKD therapy should be, at least one of them, should be to decrease this this, uh, the cyclic AMP levels if you can. And uh, I mean, cyclic AMP, even at normal levels, is going to be uh, a, a bad thing. So uh, if it's increased, it's more of a bad thing. And so you want to, you want to decrease its levels. And so the therapies, and this is a list of 
therapies in clinicaltrials.gov that I'm going to go through and just mention very briefly. Um, the therapy, the list of these therapies really starts with, with uh, tolvaptan and lixivaptan, which, which are uh, designed to lower uh, intracellular cyclic AMP. Lixivaptan is, is now uh, entering clinical trials. <clears throat> And then um, <clears throat> the somatostatin receptor ligands as well, octreotide, lanreotide, and passireotide uh, are three different versions of, of somatostatin. They're long-lasting, uh, and so they can be therapeutic, and they're designed to lower uh, intracellular cyclic AMP as well. <clears throat> and they do this this way, as you, you probably all know, um, tolvaptan, the vaptans, basically block um, the, the vasopressin II receptor um, to, to inhibit an activator of adenylate cyclase, whereas the, the somatostatins activate a, um, a cell surface G-protein couple receptor to activate an inhibitor of adenylate cyclase, in both cases lowering intracellular cyclic AMP. And so in both cases, these compounds are working on cell surface G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCRs, to carry out their therapeutic activities. <clears throat> and in doing so, what they're doing is <clears throat> lowering cyclic AMP, which is really driving the two major pathogenic processes in cyst growth and enlargement, the abnormal cell proliferation and the abnormal cyst filling fluid secretion, which depends on CFTR-dependent chloride trans, uh, transport. <clears throat> so both compounds inhibit cyclic AMP and therefore inhibit cyst growth. So it makes sense, therefore, to, to, target, to, to target cyclic AMP. It's high on this, this uh, pyramid, and a lot of things are downstream of it. Now, uh, what else can we target, though, in thinking about therapies? Well, there's mTOR, and you've already heard about that from, uh, from Terry. And I'd like to just mention briefly, uh, Sirolimus and Everolimus have uh, two mTOR inhibitors have been, uh, they work very effectively in animal models of PKD, and they uh, have been in clinical trials not so successfully, but uh, there's, there's now an ongoing sirolimus trial uh, looking at the, uh, the method of dosing sirolimus. And, and I think, personally, that, that there's a lot of hope still that mTOR inhibitors will be effective therapies once uh, we understand better how to dose, what levels, at what stage of um, PKD progression is the best time. And these uh, mTOR inhibitors could be used in combination with other therapies as well. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to men mention metformin uh, briefly. Um, uh, again, Terry Watnick mentioned this. Um, there are Two trials ongoing uh, currently. Uh, metformin has a, a long track record of safety um, in patients with diabetes, and uh, it holds a lot of promise for PKD because it inhibits cell proliferation for a couple of reasons. One, it inhibits mTOR um, itself by activating AMPK, and uh, it inhibits the ERK pathway as well, and it inhibits uh, CFTR and therefore fluid secretion. So just to show you this, metformin activates AMPK, AMP, this is AMP activated protein kinase, which then tends to inhibit mTOR and PERC. So it's really inhibiting a couple of essential pathways that are important for cell proliferation. So as I said, there's a lot of promise for uh, metformin because not only does it inhibit cell proliferation, but also 
inhibits CFTR. <clears throat> now, what about other pathways that, that lie downstream that could be targets for therapy that um, may affect gene expression and therefore the phenotypic transformation? Well, we have uh, basutinib and tesavatinib, which are both tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, basutinib is uh, thought to be primarily a SARC family inhibitor, uh, and tesavatinib is, is more of a multi-kinase inhibitor, so it can provide combination therapy, if you will, by targeting a number of pathways, including pathways activated by cyclic AMP. Um, here is a uh, bardoxolone methyl is a NERF2 activator. So NERF2 is a transcription factor that normally is kept inactivated in cells by this protein, KEEP1. So KEEP1 keeps NERF2 in an inactive cytosolic conformation, even drives it toward proteasome uh, degradation. But what bardoxolone methyl does is to cause dissociation of this complex, releasing NERF2 to translocate to the nucleus where it can activate antioxidant uh, genes, including heme oxygenase 1, and that would then uh, alleviate the oxidative stress that, that occurs in PKD cells. Now, the interesting thing to me uh, is that, that it actually can cooperate with tolvaptan um, through a cyclic AMP um, independent pathway. So apparently uh, tolvaptan can bind V2R in the ER, and because it's not a physiological ligand, it triggers the activation of PERC, which is a kinase, that can then phosphorylate NERF2, causing dissociation of NERF2 from, from KEEP1. Uh, so it basically does the same thing as bardoxolone methyl, and therefore the two, the two could work together and perhaps uh, even synergistically. We, uh, we will uh, see what happens in the future with these, these trials. I want to uh, mention also uh, pioglitazone, a PPAR gamma agonist. Uh, this is a nuclear receptor, so it's a transcription factor. <clears throat> and uh, pioglitazone, um, it, you know, is used widely to treat diabetes. Uh, it's it's uh, fairly safe. Um, uh, apparently, low doses are effective in PKD animal models, and uh, it targets a, a number of pathways that are important to inhibit in PKD, including self-proliferation, CFTR activity, uh, even possibly raising the expression levels of the PKD1 gene. Now, in thinking of therapies, I've mentioned already ERK, and uh, you should know that ERK activates the transcription factor MYC, which then activates CERT1, which is also activated by protein kinase A. So CERT1 is um, elevated and abnormally functioning in, in PKD cells. So uh, it's a potential target for um, PKD therapy. So CERT1 is a, nicot a nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide dependent protein deacetylase. And it promotes cis growth by deacetylating and causing increased phosphorylation of the RB protein or retinoblastoma protein. And it can be inhibited by niacinamide or nicotinamide, uh, which is it's a CERT inhibitor in, in a non-competitive way. And the way that works is that uh, nicotinamide or niacinamide, the, the analog of vitamin B3, is a precursor to the biosynthesis of NAD+, which is used as a cofactor by a number of enzymes, including the sirtuins, or SIRT1 in particular. Um, during the deacetylation reaction, NAD+, is cleaved, 
And that reaction can actually be inhibited by higher levels of nicotinamide or niacinamide. So that is a potential therapy that, that uh, should be examined. You can see here in this scheme, nicotinamide inhibiting CERT1 could inhibit not only RB, but also the STAT3 pathway to inhibit cell proliferation. <clears throat> Hydrolyzine is, is another compound that's worth uh, mentioning. It's um, a, a DNMT1 inhibitor. Now, hydrolyzine has been around for quite a while. It's a vasodilator. It's an antihypertensive. Uh, it's used in uh, preeclampsia and so forth. A little tricky to use, I think. Uh, but it inhibits the ERK pathway and decreases DNMT expression. Uh, now, DNMT or DNMT1 is a DNA methyl transferase. So its activity is increased in PKD. It methylates DNA, including promoters of uh, tumor suppressor genes and so forth. So um, hydrolyzine would inhibit that process, decrease its expression, and decrease promoter methylation. And it is, uh, uh, it is therapeutic in animal models of PKD. Um, <clears throat> Statin therapy um, has also been mentioned uh, today. Uh, that's certainly something to look at, uh, certainly inhibiting the lipid modification of RAS family. Um, uh, proteins, G proteins in cells would be anti-proliferative and would also be anti-inflammatory. And on this list of um, <clears throat> compounds that I call primary pathways, um, and I call these primary because we have some idea of the targets that they're inhibiting. Uh, I'd like to mention this uh, microRNA, anti-microRNA, RGLS4326, which inhibits um, <clears throat> microRNA17. Now, this shows kind of the rationale for uh, inhibiting microRNAs. This is a, a growing cyst, and you can see here that microRNA-17 promotes proliferation of cystic epithelial cells, and it regulates uh, PKD1 and PKD2 gene dosage. It actually decreases the levels of expression of, of, of PKD1 and PKD2. And so by inhibiting this microRNA with an anti-microRNA, which is basically a nucleotide sequence that would bind to it and inactivate it, it will uh, be therapeutic and may even uh, increase the, the, the level of expression of the PKD genes. So now, um, <clears throat> those were the, the primary um, pathways uh, that uh, target uh, what, I, what I would say would be what we kind of have a good idea of what's being targeted. Over here is a list of what I'd call secondary pathways. And here we have uh, these, these treatments, these therapies would have a more of a broad range um, effect on, on the physiology of uh, PKD cells and also on patients. So we have a lot of dietary uh, modifications, which are all based on, on very solid rationales. Uh, Tri triptolide um, is, is a Chinese herbal medicine that probably does a lot of things. Um, it's reported to increase intracellular calcium, and it has beneficial effects in, uh, in PKD mouse models. And then there are the, the blood pressure treatments. Uh, the, the ACE-ARB treatment has been through clinical trials, and, and it was shown that the combination treatment wasn't wasn't that effective. Um, and there are some other trials that are looking at other combinations using calcium channel blockers, and it will be interesting to see what happens there because I raise the concern that using calcium channel blockers may actually lower calcium to a dangerous level and exacerbate the cyst-forming process. And then, um, <clears throat> finally on this list, uh, Venglistat, 
um, is an interesting compound to look at. Um, this information is on the PKD Foundation website, and so you can go there for this uh, in information. So Venglistat is a glucosyl ceramide synthase inhibitor. Uh, so it's an enzyme inhibitor. Uh, there are sphingo, uh, glycosphingolipids that are present uh, in, at, at abnormally high levels in uh, PKD kidneys from PKD mouse models and in, in human kidneys. And, uh, and, and this compound will inhibit one of the enzymes responsible for their synthesis. Um, this, this compound was developed for treating lysosomal dysfunctions, such as Fabre, Gaucher, and Parkinson's disease, so uh, that would be a good candidate. And uh, it, 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 it does serve as a p potential treatment for PKD because uh, in humans, it's, it's a well-tolerated drug. So Sanofi Genzyme has uh, initiated a trial. They're recruiting patients. Uh, um, the compound has received orphan drug designation, and it looks like it will be a big trial. <clears throat> So those were uh, compounds that are in, uh, in clinical trials. These are um, some of the con compounds that uh, are in preclinical trials now. They're being experimented on in animal models. And I'll mention a few. <clears throat> There's um, MIF inhibition. Uh, MIF is macrophage migra uh, migration inhibitory factor. Uh, it's high on on this uh, pyramid, if you will, uh, just under PKD1 uh, mutation. And so it affects a, a lot of pathways that drive cyst formation. And there is a compound, ISO1, which um, has uh, been showing uh, effect, effectiveness in uh, PKD animal models. Roscovitine is <clears throat> another compound. Um, it's a CDK, or cyclin-dependent kinase, and inhibitor. Uh, it's, uh, it and, and a related compound are, are quite effective in targeting a number of pathways by targeting CDKs and casein kinase uh, to inhibit cystogenesis, cell proliferation, uh, MYC activity, uh, mTOR, Wnt signaling, and hedgehog signaling. So it shows a lot of promise as well. And uh, I mentioned hedgehog signaling. Hedgehog uh, in inhibitors are present, GANT61 and SANT2. Um, and these show efficacy in animal models. Um, hedgehog, uh, the hedgehog pathway was mentioned earlier by Terry Watnick. Uh, it's uh, ciliary-centric, um, OK? So the cilia. Re uh, facilitate hedgehog signaling. Hedgehog signaling requires cilia. So with disruption of cilia in PKD, there may be um, an overactivation of, of the hedgehog pathway. Uh, that connection hasn't actually been made uh, very clearly in PKD yet. But um, there is promise um, for some of these hedgehog inhibitors. They, they do show efficacy in animal models. I'd like to jump down here to CFTR in, uh, inhibition. Uh, a couple of uh, compounds uh, have proven to be effective in, um, in, in animal models, um, including CFTR INH172. These are open channel inhibitors of uh, the CFTR protein. So they actually block the uh, chloride transport. And uh, they, are, they are effective, so uh, they could be used either directly or in combination. And then lastly on this list, I'd like to say a few things about HSP90 inhibition. <clears throat> so <clears throat> HSP90 um, is a ubiquitous protein, uh, very abundant in cells. It's found in all cells. It's um, required to help stabilize uh, proteins as they're being made. It's, um, uh, it's required to 
keep kinases and, and transcription factors kind of poised for activation. And uh, it's, you know, it helps to stabilize proteins that have become denatured. So it's, it's really a, a, an essential protein, but even more essential in, um, in, in stressed cells, like in PKD cells and in cancer cells. So inhibiting HSP90 is, is a therapeutic route. Now, HSP90 functions by <clears throat> binding to a number of co-chaperones, each one in turn that binds to a set of HSP90 client proteins, and these can be transcription factors, protein kinases, receptors, and so forth. <clears throat> Now, in PKD, we know that um, several pathways are, are abnormal, cell proliferation, fluid secretion, cell growth, and these are the pathways leading to, um, to the activation of those. And every one of these circled pathway intermediates is an HSP90 client protein. So there's hope that by um, using an HSP90 inhibitor that these proteins would become destabilized and maybe their, their uh, levels would decrease in cells and this would be therapeutic in PKD, sort of like a multi-target. So an HSP90 inhibitor would be a multi-target uh, therapy. So there's a, a list of, of HSP90 um, inhibitors that's, that's been around now for uh, uh, cancer chemotherapeutics, and I'd like to mention one right here that has been used successfully for PKD by Erica Golamis. Um, and this one, um, you can see in this PKD1 mouse model, after six months of treatment, um, treatment with this compound, as opposed to none, you can see that it's really quite effective. And uh, it uh, shows a decrease in cystic index and the other parameters of, uh, of kidney enlargement and kidney function that we all look at. So using, uh, seeing that um, made us consider one of, one of these compounds that we had an interest in, uh, leninamine and a derivative, uh, H2-gamendazole. Um, now, leninamine has, it's been around for a long time. It has a number of interesting properties for PKD therapy. Um, it inhibits mitochondrial function, it's anti-angiogenic, it increases intracellular calcium, and it's an open channel inhibitor of CFTR. And it was uh, discovered, not by us, but one of our colleagues, that um, one of its derivatives, gamendazole, was uh, actually directly bound uh, HSP90. And we followed that up and found that it's, a, uh, it's an HSP90 inhibitor. And that's shown here. I'll just show a couple of uh, slides showing its, its effectiveness. So in this embryonic kidney organ culture model uh, that we use a lot. We take uh, kidneys from, from mouse embryos here at uh, embryonic day age 15.5. We put them in culture and, and grow them in culture over a four-day period in the presence of cyclic AMP. And you can see that in, in genetically uh, heterozygous P for PKD1 or uh, homozygous null for PKD1, these kidneys get quite a few of these large cystic dilations that we think is due largely to fluid secretion in this particular model. And this is in, inhibited uh, very effectively by uh, gamendazole treatment. These are paired kidneys, two kidneys from the same animal, and again, two kidneys from the same uh, animal. And you can see the effectiveness of this uh, this compound, and then in vivo, uh, in a PKD1 um, conditional mouse model with a PKHD1 CRE, given daily IP injections from postnatal day eight, eight to 18, you can see that um, H2 gamendazole treatment was really quite effective in preventing 
the, the enlargement of these kidneys over this period of time. And all of the measures of kidney function were uh, somewhat normalized as well. So we think that um, this suggests to us that HSP90 inhibitors might be another class of drugs that could be uh, therapeutic uh, in PKD. Uh, <clears throat> this shows the, the effectiveness on survival of these mice. This is, uh, these are untreated mice, and these are uh, mice that were treated with h 2 gamendazole and you can see that their survival was increased. So we're looking further at the use of uh, h 2 gamendazole So finally, just a few words about uh, therapies over the horizon, <clears throat> and I've already alluded to one of them. And what I mean by that is getting up here to the peak of the pyramid where the PKD mutation is. If we could reverse this itself, that would help uh, in, in treating uh, the entire uh, abnormal cascade that you see here. And uh, one of these compounds was the antimere because it actually regulates PKD1 and PKD2 gene dosage. So this should be therapeutic in uh, patients if they have any residual uh, functional uh, PKD, maybe insufficient, but if they have residual function, then by increasing the, the levels of, of, that, uh, of those proteins would be therapeutic. And uh, having said that then, um, I should also mention that activation of the PC1, PC2, the polycystin complex, uh, should also be therapeutic in the same way. So if we could develop drugs or peptides or find ligands, that would actually stimulate the activity of, um, uh, of the, the polycystin complex in patients that have partially functioning uh, poly uh, polycystin complexes, this should be therapeutic. And then finally, um, I need to mention pre-implantation genetic diagnosis because this is beginning to be used. Uh, this affords the opportunity to select embryos for implantation that do not contain the, the PKD mutation, and it's being looked at in a big way in China. I'm not sure it's going to receive the same um, uh, appeal here in, in, in uh, North America, uh, but uh, because of that, I think we all need to focus on trying to understand uh, the function of the, of the, PK, uh, the P PC1, PC2 polycystin complex better and to better understand the um, pathogenesis of the disease and ultimately to try to come up with new therapies uh, for new targets that we discover. So <clears throat> with that, uh, we can move to our quiz. So question one is, among the drugs listed below, which targets a membrane GPCR to lower cyclic AMP in cystic tissues? One, tolvaptin, two, metformin, three, octreotide, Four would be one and two, and five would be one and three. You may begin. <clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> one and three, and uh, many of you uh, indeed got that. Uh, would be the best answer in, in my view. Uh, I tried to make the point that both tolvaptin and octreotide are compounds that, that bind to and either inhibit or activate their, their cell surface GPCR, the G protein coupled receptor, and in doing so, they both, uh, they both uh, in, inhibit, uh, they lower cyclic AMP. Now, metformin, um, doesn't work on a cell surface GPCR, and so that's why it's not correct. Okay. 
Question two, which of the following acts to inhibit both cell proliferation and CFTR? One, metformin, two, H2, gamendazole, three, roscovitin, four, one and two, five, two and three. Okay, very good. So one and two, metformin and gamendazole, are, are particularly useful because they inhibit both cell proliferation and CFTR. Roscovitin uh, actually acts on CFTR, but actually protects it. It actually raises the activity of CFTR, so it would not be therapeutic in, uh, in PKD. So thank you. You did well. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you.